let's start building up in complexity. So we've just been talking about atoms, and it turns out atoms can be connected together. They can be used sort of like little building blocks in order to build larger things. When we connect multiple atoms together, what we get is a molecule. And a molecule is something that can be small, it could be just two atoms connected together, or it could be huge. It could be like a, a, um, something where hundreds of atoms have j been joined together. So molecules come in a lot of different sizes, um, but they all involve these stable associations between multiple atoms. Okay, so some examples of molecules would be things like water, things, very f familiar things, um, and then table salt. Those are different examples of associations between atoms. And notice with these molecules, it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be the same type of atoms. It doesn't have to be atoms of the same element. It can actually, actually be atoms of different elements that join together. So um, having just looked at how neat and tidy each atom is on its own, why would this happen? Why do atoms join up together? There is actually a driving force for this to happen. There's a reason why it happens. And it's gonna tie back in with the electron shells that we were mentioning. So remember each atom has electron shells around it where the electrons tend to hang out. And it turns out that atoms are most stable, they're sort of like happiest, when their shell, their outermost shell, is completely full. So if it's not completely full, if it doesn't have the maximum number of electrons, it's kind of like there's a driving force for, um, for something to happen. And what can happen is if that atom joins up with another atom, then maybe it will be able to complete that shell, that outer outermost shell. We'll take a look at some examples of this in just a minute. Okay, so basically when this happens, when this association happens, it results in what's called a chemical bond. And there are three major types of chemical bonds. You'll need to know all three of them, so we'll take a look at them one at a time. We're going to start off with a covalent bond. This is a very strong type of bond, and it involves um, a direct sharing of electrons between two atoms. There are other types of bonds possible too. Maybe instead of sharing electrons, maybe one atom completely hands off its electron to another one. That's gonna give us what's called an ionic bond. And then the last one on the list, this one's easiest to explain with a picture. So I'll just wait till I have the picture up and then we'll talk about what a hydrogen bond is. Let's start off with covalent bonds. Let's look at some pictures of covalent bonds. So right here we've got two hydrogen atoms Remember hydrogen on the periodic table was number one. Okay, it has one proton. Ordinarily it has just one electron. And what was true about the innermost shell? You can go back and check your notes if you, if you don't have this memorized quite yet. The innermost electron shell can hold a maximum of two electrons. So hydrogen is going to be most stable if it can somehow get one more electron in that shell. So what happens is two hydrogens come together, each one brings one electron, and um, if they just share both of their electrons, then both of these atoms are happier. Okay, so this ends up making a molecule. It's a molecule um, H2, it has two hydrogen atoms. This is how that molecule would be represented, so H2. And that right there, that is a covalent bond between these two hydrogen atoms. Similarly with oxygen, oxygen can form a covalent bond. Let's jump down to this middle picture, take a look. So oxygen on the periodic table is, let's go back and check. Oxygen is right here, it's number eight. So it has eight protons ordinarily, and that means it would also have eight electrons. Um, so if we think about the electron structure, it has a total of eight electrons. Two of those electrons are gonna go into the innermost shell. And then all of the rest are gonna go into the second shell. So it's gonna have six floating in this second shell, but that shell can hold a total of eight. So there are like two open spaces. So what does oxygen do? It likes to pair up with something else. It pairs up with another oxygen. And see what's happening there is they're sharing some of their electrons and this completes that outermost shell for both atoms. So if we count them up, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, 
seven, eight, eight electrons total in the second shell. So that's a full shell. This is very stable. They are both happy now. Okay, um, this is also happens to be called a double bond. So up here with hydrogen, there was one set, one pair of electrons being shared. That gives us a single bond. This one, there are two sets of electrons being shared. It's called a double bond. Not a big deal at this point, just kind of mentioning it to start getting some of these words out there and familiar to you. Let's look at a case where we have different elements coming together. So this is a water molecule right down here. In the case of water, we have, again, oxygen um, ordinarily has six electrons in that outermost shell, so it can take on two more. Um, so what's one way that that could, could be satisfied? Well, if it shares with two hydrogen atoms, okay, then um, the outermost shell of oxygen is going to be filled. And same thing for hydrogen. Its outermost shell, which can only hold two electrons, is now filled. So all three of these atoms are now in the very stable electron configurations. So this water molecule is nice and stable due to the presence of these covalent bonds that have formed. There are a couple of other words on the slide here, nonpolar versus versus polar. These are different types or varieties of covalent bonds that can form. Um, the big difference between them is whether the sharing is equal or unequal. So if we're talking about a nonpolar bond, that just means the electrons are being shared very equally between the two atoms, just like they are in these top two cases. A polar bond means that the electrons are being held a little bit more closely towards one atom than the other. And so as a result, like in this water molecule down here, as a result, see how most of the electrons tend to be kind of on, on this end of the molecule? There aren't so many electrons over here or over here. Okay, this end over here tends to be a little bit more negatively charged, and this end over here would tend to be a little bit more positively charged. So we would say that this is a polar molecule, and we'll be coming back to polarity in the course uh, later on. This is where it comes from. It's due to where the electrons are localized at. Next up, we've got ionic bonds. All right, so with an, an ionic bond, we're gonna look at the example of sodium and chlorine joining together to form table salt. Sodium chloride is table salt. And if you look at the electron structures here, okay, for a sodium atom, just an isolated atom, it has uh, one electron that's just hanging out by itself in its outermost electron shell. And chlorine, on the other hand, is missing one electron from its outermost electron shell. So what's the logical thing to do? This one is going to jump over here, and that way chlorine will have a filled outer shell, and sodium will have a filled outer shell also. Okay, so it just it gets rid of that electron so that this next shell in um, is now a complete shell, and it's the outermost one that's exposed to the rest of the world. So in the end, what we end up with, if sodium gives up an electron, then sodium is gonna be positively charged. This is actually an ion right here. And chlorine, it takes on an extra electron. So it's now charged also, it's negatively charged. It's an ion also. And what do we know about opposites, right? Opposite charges tend to attract each other. So this positive sodium ion is going to be attracted to this negative chloride ion. And that's called an ionic bond, that attraction between these two. So it's a different style from a covalent bond, um, but still the end result is that these two things are gonna stick together. Our third type of bonding, this, one's, this, this is the one that I said is gonna be easier to understand if a picture is in front of you. So here it is, here's a picture. We're going to look at two water molecules and consider where hydrogen bonding might happen. So remember the polarity that we were talking about, polar versus nonpolar? Water is a polar molecule. The electron cloud tends to be more focused down on this end um, than on this end. So I have some positive charges indicated up there, negative over here. And that polar molecule is going to do something interesting. Okay, so over here is another polar water molecule. And you'll notice, okay, so here's a positive section. 
it's kind of close to this negative section, they're going to be attracted to each other. And that thing right there, that attraction between molecules, that's called a hydrogen bond. It's called a hydrogen bond because there's a hydrogen involved. <laughs> yeah, hydrogen with a, uh, from a polar molecule is um, being attracted to something in another molecule. So anyway, it gets called a hydrogen bond. But this dashed yellow line right here is what's representing the hydrogen bond in this picture. It turns out hydrogen bonds are responsible for a lot of the special properties of water that we'll be coming to a little bit later. Um, just looking at different forms of water. So water can be a liquid, in which case these hydrogen bonds are constantly being formed and broken and reformed as water molecules sort of float past each other. There's a lot of rearranging going on of the molecules and where the hydrogen bonds would be at. Um, when you freeze water, so when water turns to ice, it's actually the hydrogen bonds that are stabilizing the structure. And this is why water turns solid, is because of those hydrogen bonds. They help to form, um, help to make all of these molecules just exist in kind of like this lattice work structure. So that's kind of interesting. And then water vapor, if you, if you boil water or if just water evaporates, um, what happens is those hydrogen bonds have to break in order for water molecules to float off from the surface and leave into the atmosphere. So let's start to pull this back into, um, into the context of living things. We've described a lot of basic chemistry so far in this chapter, and it turns out that there are actually just a few elements that um, are gonna be coming up a lot for us in the context of human biology. So the most common elements in living things, if we just take a look at this chart here in terms of which elements are we talking about and what is the percentage um, of a human body, like in terms of weight. Okay, if you take a look, oxygen, oxygen actually makes up 65% of our weight. A lot of that is in the form of water molecules, right, H2O. So hydrogen also is on this list. Hydrogen makes up about 10% of our weight. Um, but in total, okay, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and also calcium and phosphorus. Okay, all of those put together make up about 99% of our body weight. So these are the elements we're going to be seeing a lot of this semester. And then there are a few others that are present in small amounts, but they're still super important. For example, sodium and chlorine, we're gonna be seeing these in iron, um, ion form uh, in certain chapters quite a bit. So we'll come back to, to those as needed. But anyway, in terms of composition, there there are really only a few elements that we're going to be getting super familiar with. 